everyone, this is Winnie. Welcome back to PSW Exam Prep. Happy New Year to all of you. Happy 2023. We're going to get the year started with a suggestion that I received from quite a few of you, even in the comments. You wanted me to go over the chapters that are required for studying purposes. So what I will do is I will go over the chapters, but I will also just give a summary on each module. This is going to be beneficial for students, and this is hopefully also going to be beneficial for those who are writing the NAC. So let me know what you think. Today we shall be covering module one. So I will just highlight the chapters that NAC wants you to know, and this is based on the fifth edition book. So here are the chapters that are listed for your reference. And just be sure to go over these chapters and these pages and just be aware, for example, chapter 23, you don't have to read the whole chapter 23. Just look at the pages that they say in order for you not to read too much. So I'm hoping you find this video helpful. This is just a summary on what module one is all about. So like I said, the summary about this module is just introducing what it is to be a PSW. This is how they're laying the foundations to really talk about your role, for you to understand what it is that you will be doing, what kind of workplace settings will you be in, what's the legislation that's around everything that you're going to do. You're also going to learn about an interdisciplinary team, and you're also going to learn about your scope of practice as a PSW. So you might ask, why is it important to understand this module? Why is it important to understand these terms? So we will go over the summary and I will say, this is a summary guys, you will still need to do your own thorough study, but I'm hoping that this supports you along the way. So the first thing that I will talk about is the difference between a patient, resident, and client. It might seem like the same thing and people might think, you know, you can interchange them, but you have to be very careful about these three words. You have to know what type of setting you are working in and what kind of word you will use. So a patient is someone who is in a hospital setting. A resident is someone who's in a long-term care home or a retirement home. A client is in a community setting. So I remember when I first started nursing, I had all three jobs. I was working in a hospital. I was also working in the community. And I was also working as um, in a long-term care center. So I just had to remember when I was documenting that I would say patient in the hospital, that I would say client in the community, and then, of course, I would say resident in the long-term care home that I was working at. So a way that I usually remember this is that I say client C is for community. I don't know if that will help anybody, but it's important for you to know where to use these words. The second thing is you need to understand what a regulated worker is. So for example, nurses are regulated, OTs are regulated, and an OT is an occupational therapist. PTs are regulated, and that's a physiotherapist. So regulated workers are self-governing and they have to report to a college. They also pay what we call annual fees. For example, as a nurse, I have to pay some fees every year. But what happens is if anything happens or if some care doesn't go well, for example, neglect, you know, or some type of maleficence, then of course, this is reportable to the college. But you as a PSW, you are certified, so you do not report to any governing body. The third thing that we were going to talk about is what we just mentioned, that a PSW is known as a UCP, which is an unregulated care provider. And like I said, you do not report to any governing body. The next point is understanding the Canadian healthcare system. So this is covered in chapter two of the fifth edition. But you need to understand that although we follow Western practices, for example, going to the physician, you know, um, and then going for different types of treatment that we're going to talk about, which is primary, secondary, and tertiary, although we do these things, we must respect cultural differences. 
So a lot of times, especially in Canada, we're a melting pot, meaning we have a lot of immigrants from different, different places. So we need to understand these cultural practices in order for us to be culturally sensitive, to be honest. Because if you try to impose your views or your values or your culture on another patient, then this is not good. And this is what we call cultural conflict. Another thing we need to respect are the indigenous healthcare practices. And I'll give some examples. So indigenous healthcare practices include using ceremonies. They believe in Mother Earth. They also believe that plants and animals have energy and that they relieve or get a lot of health from these particular factors. So you shouldn't go with that approach or a judgmental approach of, oh, so you didn't take this medication, you should do it. Because that means that you are putting your values and your beliefs of Western medical practices on somebody who has their own practices. So it's very important to be empathetic and respectful. So the next point that we're going to talk about is primary health care, secondary health care, and tertiary health care. So what is the difference with these three? So primary health care, to be frank, is just the first point of contact with the health care system. This is the first time you go to your doctor. This is the first time you have your own private doctor or the first time you actually have a family doctor or the first time you go to a walk-in clinic but it's just that first point of contact. Secondary is like additional layer to primary. This now includes a little bit more complexity in that there are more assessments. This is when something is a bit more complex than before. So maybe your primary contact would be you go to the doctor because you have the flu. But maybe they discover that with this flu, you possibly need some treatment. You probably need like a CT, MRI, because maybe you have a lung infection or they want to really figure out what's going on with you. Then you need more assessments and more complex care. Finally, tertiary healthcare is the most expensive type of healthcare, and we try our best not to go there. But of course, sometimes, you know, you cannot prevent that. So what is tertiary healthcare? This is specialized. This is the highest level of care. This is now when you go beyond the primary, you go beyond the secondary. So this is, for example, for your teeth when you need an orthodontist, you know, so you're going higher and higher and needing a specialized level of care. Or if you need like an ENT, you know, ear, nose, throat specialist, like you're going higher and need an actual specialist to deal with a particular issue that you are facing. So the next point is to understand ethics. So what are ethics? Ethics are what discovers or what really determines right versus wrong. That's the definition of ethics in a nutshell. So we have covered justice, we've covered beneficence, and we've covered all these other factors, especially non-maleficence in other videos. So please be sure to review them just to understand what they mean. I will give another summary now, but the videos will be helpful because they also have questions just for you to understand it a little bit further. But again, like we said, ethics are the rules of conduct to guide one in deciding what is right or wrong. But a moral is something that one believes is right for himself. So my moral is what I think is right for me as Winnie. But that doesn't mean it's right for Jim. It's right for Mary. It's right for Sarah. It's just a moral. And it's something that I believe. And it's based on my upbringing. It's based on my values. It's based on a lot of different factors. My culture. Just my the way my life has been. So that's what determines my morals. Morals are very personal and individualized. So what are the things, what are the terms that you need to know in the ethics chapter? You need to know about autonomy. So autonomy means self-determination. This allows patients to make decisions for themselves and about themselves. This is where you allow Mrs. Smith to wear the red shirt with the purple pants and the yellow shoes because that's what she wants to do. So you are not imposing your needs or your 
beliefs or your perception or your clothing style on her, you are allowing her to wear what she wants to wear because she has a right to determine herself. Justice is different to autonomy and that is just treating everyone in a fair manner. So an example is just because one of the patients eats very slowly, it would not be fair for you to not give them care and just go give the care or help feed the patient who eats quickly. That's not justice. Fairness means you treat people equally regardless of their limitations, regardless of how you feel it will make your job feel. Justice is fairness for all. Beneficence is when you do good for a patient. So that's it in a nutshell. But the way I remember beneficence is beneficence has the word benefit in there. So this is just benefiting a patient. Non-maleficence. So if you remember the movie Maleficence, Malef- I don't remember but that movie, but it was a movie about doing bad. So the word non in front of it shows that you are doing no harm. That's pretty much it. So for example, you don't perform a task outside of your scope just because you get along with the family. They'll say, you know what? We really like you. Just insert this catheter. I know you can do it. You don't have the training. You know it's not in your scope. As soon as you insert that catheter, you are doing harm because this is a skill that you were not trained for. So you have to be very careful that you're not out there trying to please families and putting yourself and the patient into some type of jeopardy, I would say. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is the Residence Bill of Rights. So as you know, we in this profession as PSWs work with a lot of different patients, but I will say that the majority of patients that you will work with are older adults. So the Residence Bill of Rights goes back to what we said before, where resident obviously is something to do with the retirement home or the long-term care. But the Residence Bills of Rights is usually in a long-term care setting because they even have committees and stuff like that to discuss how the long-term care is governing a lot of factors and they bring it over and they discuss everything month by month to make sure that the residents are happy with the care. Because what you have to realize is that long-term care is their home. And this is maybe the last home that they will have before they unfortunately pass away. So it's very important to ensure that we have a Bill of Rights. So what are the examples of Bill of Rights? So the examples include like the right to privacy. Privacy meaning if you're providing care, make sure that their roommate is not seeing everything you're doing. Close the curtains. And then there's also the right to confidentiality. Don't go to the hallway and start talking about Mrs. Smith and what happened. Or don't go tell your friend on another floor what's happening on your floor. That is none of their business. And that is actually violating somebody's confidentiality. The right to autonomy, as we already mentioned. And the right to give or withhold informed consent. So what is informed consent? So informed consent means consent where you have been informed. So this means that you give somebody some information and then they make the decision as to whether they want to do what you said or not. So the patient has the right to decide what will and will not be done to his or her body and who can touch them. They need to understand the reason for the treatment what will be done, and how and who will do it. There must also be an an understanding or a discussion of outcomes and treatment options. You cannot just give one option. You have to outline all the information. And by outlining all the information, this is when we say it is informed consent. The next important one is advanced directives. So I did have someone who just took the exam and they called me and they said they had so many questions about SDMs and POAs. And thankfully, we had spoken about that, but it's just maybe something that people might overlook, but it's very important, especially in the NAC exam. So we're going to discuss that right now. So advanced directives are legal documents that allow someone to discuss decisions 
about his or her own end of life care. So what happens typically when a person is newly diagnosed? I will give an examples of dementia. That point, they may still be very cognitively aware and they could then make the decision of, you know what, in the event that I am now incapacitated or where I am deemed incapable, I would like somebody to make decisions for me because my decisions are unsafe. So what will happen in this point is they will appoint a POA. There are different types of POA and this is a power of attorney. So you can have a power of attorney for finance, you can have a power of attorney for property, you can have a power of attorney for personal care, you can have a power of attorney for a lot of different things. You can have one power of attorney, or you can have all your children as power of attorneys jointly, or you can have all your children as power of attorneys jointly and severally. So the difference with jointly means that everybody in that power of attorney has the right to make the decision and they all have to have an unanimous vote on the decision. If one person disagrees, it's not going to happen. Jointly and severally, however, means that one person can make the decision and the other people do not have to be present. So that's the difference with POA jointly and POA jointly and severally. So the substitute decision maker is in the same league. It's not as legal as the POA. The substitute decision maker has a ladder. And the ladder can be reviewed. If you look up online, SDM ladder, you will see who's at the top and who's at the bottom. But there are some people who do not have family members. And if they don't have family members, you as the institution or the PSW cannot make a decision for them. It goes to who we call PG&T, who is the public guardian and trust. So they make the decision for the patient. But the substitute decision maker is not legal. The POA is legal. So the SDM is just somebody who, again, makes the decisions as a substitute. So this allows a person to make decisions for another person who is unable to give consent due to inability to understand. And the other one in the section is the living will. This is a document that allows patients to outline their wishes to accept or refuse medical care to sustain their life. A good example is a DNR, do not resuscitate. Someone can say, do not resuscitate me. If there's anything that happens in an emergency situation, I do not want any life-saving measures. This is something that you have to abide by. So this is what we are talking about when we talk about advanced directives. The next thing you need to know about in module one is torts, battery, assaults, etc. So I did cover these and you can find these in a separate video, 10 random questions you cannot get wrong in the NAC exam. All right, the next thing that we're going to talk about is holistic health. So this is very important, but sometimes can be missed. The concepts of holism is something that dated way back when there was such a priority on physical health only. It was previously believed that health is just the absence of illness. So if you're physically okay, everything else doesn't matter. But things have changed. We now value holism. So according to the World Health Organization, the definition of health has changed. So health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So holism considers the whole person. There is a diagram in your book, and it kind of shows like what the components are for holism. But these include physical, social, spiritual, emotional, and cognitive health. What this means is, if I have physical, spiritual, emotional, and cognitive, but I do not have social, I am not healthy. All of these need to be there for holism to be there and for me to feel healthy. They must all be present for your health. So another one that we already covered, but we're going to cover it is dips. 
I'm hoping by now through these videos, you're really starting to see the importance of dips. But like I say, a lot of times they show it at the end of every chapter. So they will throw in a dips question. But let's really discuss what dips means. You know, you might know what it stands for, but let's go into it a little bit more detailed. So the first one is D, which is dignity. And this just means making somebody feel valued. The next one, the I has two. So sometimes you can see dips with D-I-I or sometimes it's just D-I, but you just have to know that the I stands for two things. The first I stands for independence. This is where you allow patients to do things for themselves. So honest truth, it's much easier to just do everything for somebody. It's quicker, but that does not promote independence. That does not promote autonomy. That, in fact, infantilizes a patient. And in fact, it sets them back. So what you always need to remember is you need to allow every patient to do as much as they can do for themselves up to their highest level. And then you step in after that level. And then we talk about individualized care. Just because Mary likes her hair a certain way doesn't mean Joanne likes her hair that way. So you need to understand and provide care based on differences from patient to patient. Do not put everyone in a one size fits all just because they're on a unit. You have to understand each patient and build a care plan that is individualized for that patient. And then we talk about preferences. So this is when you allow patients to make their choices. What do you want to wear? What do you want to eat? Do you want meal section one, meal section two, meal section three? I do know a lot of facilities I've worked at, they had different options. And then a person would pick what they wanted for lunch, for example, or maybe even two options. Do you want the salmon or do you want the meatloaf, for example? But you allow them to pick something based on their preference. And again, this is an example of maintaining their autonomy. Another one is privacy. So make sure, please, that you do not disrobe or uh, take off somebody's clothes. The privacy curtain is not is open. The curtain on the window is open. Everybody can see. This is very humiliating, particularly for somebody who's non-verbal. So you want to make sure that you close the curtains and you protect patients from public view. Or if you see somebody wandering in the hallway and they're naked, Hurry up and get a gown and then take them away and get them dressed. Provide privacy as much as you can. And then the final one is safety. So safety just means providing a safe environment for every patient. So the next thing we're going to cover in this module are social determinants of health. So there are 12 social determinants of health. So what is a social determinants of health? It's just something that really honestly determines your health in a social way. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Like the sentence actually explains what it is. So pretty much these factors determine how your health will be. For example, there are 12, but I'll give you two. One is income. So your income will determine your health based on, for example, can you afford dental insurance? I'm speaking things that maybe are not covered under OHIP right now can you afford dental insurance can you afford to go to an optometrist like can you get your eyes checked like are you able to afford these things that is your income your education level as well determines things you know so if you have higher levels of education you have more knowledge about the importance of certain things right for example, if you have a high level of education, you know, okay, if I do this, this may be a side effect. So let me do that. Let me do this. Let me do that. But I would really say the income and the education levels are tied together. But at the same time, they are also very different. It is important to know each of these 12 determinants. And these are found in chapter six in the fifth edition. The next thing that we're going to talk about is culture and diversity. So there's a difference between these two. So we already started talking about culture earlier when I spoke about cultural conflict, when you put your own cultural beliefs on someone else. 
That's not right. But culture refers to different characteristics that a group has. For example, their language, their religion, their beliefs. But diversity is an exploration of a combination of things where you look at people and all their differences and you allow for them to coexist. So an example of a place with diversity is your workplace or even your classroom has diversity. People of different colors, people of different nationalities, people of different genders, people of different ages, people who have children and people who do not. That's all an example of diversity. And this is something you need to embrace as you provide care to patients. You need to respect diversity and embrace it and welcome it. Because if you don't, now you're leaning into these negative qualities. The first one I will mention is bias. This is when you impartially judge someone because you have a notion. An example is you could say, you know, people of color have a high pain tolerance, so I'm going to prescribe less medication in terms of the dosage because they're not going to feel pain. That's a bias. You came with that preconceived notion and now you're doing something that will negatively affect somebody. And that, of course, is not just, right? Because we said justice is fairness. So bias is tied to not being just. Another one is stereotyping. So stereotyping is a belief about a group of people. You know, ageism, for example, all old people are grouchy. All old people cannot keep up with technology. All old people are just going to want to sleep all day. These are really bad, bad, bad types of stereotypes because you will find someone who's way older than you, who's excellent at technology, better than you even, someone who runs way faster than you even. So you have to learn not to stereotype. And another type of stereotype, of course, is homophobia. And unfortunately, that is something we still see in the world today. The next thing you need to know for this module is communication, but namely interpersonal communication. So interpersonal communication is communication between two people. Interpersonal is between me and someone. Intra, I-N-T-R-A, is something I communicate within myself. So if I'm communicating to someone with words, this is what we call verbal communication. Nonverbal is usually like actions or gestures, but this is the loudest and most accurate reflection of how one feels. So if you say to me, Winnie, how are you? And I say, I'm fine, but overall my face, I look, I'm frowning, I'm grimacing, I'm just honestly fidgety. That I'm fine does not match my nonverbal. So you will not believe that I'm fine. You will believe my nonverbal more than my verbal. Open-ended questions allow one to talk. They open up one to further communication, right? So what do you think you're going to do today is an example of open-ended because the person will say, well, I'm going to go to the store and then I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. But close-ended is either a yes or no. Are you going to the store today? Yes. Are you going to see your grandma today? Yes. Do you live alone? No. So those are close-ended where you do not allow further dialogue. You just kind of shut it down and then you don't kind of allow that. You need to use both, to be honest, guys, because sometimes you just need to get straight to the point. And then sometimes you need to explore. So both of them are very, very effective ways to communicate. So you also have what we call defense mechanisms. So defense mechanisms are ways one avoids uncomfortable feelings. So sometimes something can happen that is so traumatic. For example, someone very young gets raped. They can repress that memory and it's a defense mechanism not to remember that experience. Or another one could be someone just went to work, you know, I'll say Jane went to work, you know, and her boss stressed her out. The unit was busy. It was short staffed. She was just ridiculously exhausted. And she just handled it in there. But the pent up anger that she has is still within her. As soon as she walks in the door, her kids come running to her and she starts snapping at her kids. Get away from me. Shut up. You know, 
using all these negative things. So that anger that she had, she took it and that stress and she displaced it by putting it on someone where she knew she had some level of control. This is also a type of defense mechanism. So there are quite a few defense mechanisms that you can read about. The next one is the types of pain. So pain is so important, and I'll tell you why. With pain, it affects the level of care that you give someone. Pain affects what somebody understands. Like, have you ever had like a very bad migraine and someone comes and tries to tell you something important? You are not going to retain the message. You're probably going to retain about 10% of it. Pain can actually really inhibit a lot of different factors. So as a healthcare practitioner, we always want to address pain effectively and make sure that a pain level is within a therapeutic level where a person is not feeling any pain. Our goal is to have no pain. So you must understand, however, that there are different types of pain and pain is subjective. If you're in a ward where people are giving birth, you ask one mom, how are you doing? What's your pain from zero to 10? She'll say three, I'm fine. And another mom is screaming and she's saying her pain is a 15 out of 10. You know, you still need to take what they say because pain is very subjective. And you cannot compare the lady who said three with the lady who said 15 out of 10. And the 15 is just to show that it's really bad, guys. But really, honestly, the scale should be zero to 10. But I'm just giving an example. So if people are nonverbal, we look at their actions more. For example, if someone has dementia, there's a scale we call PAINAD, P-A-I-N-A-D, which actually is showing the behavior of people to quantify what the pain scale is. So there are different types. So the first one we talk about is acute pain. This is something that just starts suddenly, but it lasts below six months. Acute always means short term. Even if you go to an acute unit, you're there for a short amount of time, right? But chronic, however, lasts for longer than six months. This may be someone who was in a car accident and had a really, really bad accident and they continue to have pain. And then another one I always love to talk about and I've spoken about it in other videos is phantom limb pain. This is a body part that no longer exists, but a person will say, I'm feeling pain in my toes, but there's no like they're no toes, like they were amputated. So it's just the nerve cells and the neurons and the nervous system that are working to actually bring that pain, right? And then the last one that I'll talk about is referred pain. So referred pain is pain that shows in an area very different to the source of the pain. An example is someone having a heart attack. They might feel pain in the jaw, they might not experience the chest pain. Like, you know, when you're having a heart attack, you can have many different symptoms. But for some, it's just that feeling of a pain in the jaw and they don't know why. But the jaw is very, very far from the heart, right? So this is an example of referred pain. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is ADPI. So ADPI is important. But this is really something that the nurse does, but it's still something that you need to know about so that you can understand what the nurse is doing. So what's ADPI? It's an assessment, it's a diagnosis, but here I said nursing diagnosis, and it's planning, it's intervention, and it's evaluation. So why I put nursing diagnosis is because a nursing diagnosis is very different to a medical diagnosis. An example of a medical diagnosis is diabetes, hypertension, but a nursing diagnosis is a bit different. It's that we look after an assessment and try to kind of figure out what is going on with somebody, right? Um, for example, we can look at someone and they're kind of socially isolating themselves and we can make that a nursing diagnosis based on that type of objective data, right? So it's different to the medical, but let's discuss what ADPI really means. So the assessment is just honestly gathering all the data, looking to see what's there, what's happening. This is objective, this is subjective. You gather the data, you have it in the assessment. After you gather that data, you come up with a diagnosis that makes sense. And this also determines the care plan, which is the next thing. 
So, okay, I can see that ever since Mr. Smith came to the hospital, he's really been withdrawing. You know, he has very little social interest. What are we going to do in the care plan to promote social activity, to promote him being with other people so that he's not feeling isolated? How do we stimulate him a bit more? Once we plan it, we set it out, and then we intervene, or not intervene, we implement or we implement the interventions. So the intervention just means implementation where you actually conduct what's in the care plan. After some time, you look at Mr. Smith again and say, is it better? Is he now socially, you know, out there with other people? Is he interacting? Is there an improvement? That's the evaluation phase. If he's still not out there, he's still in his room, we need to start over. So this process can be cyclical in that you keep going and going until you find something that really works for Mr. Smith to address whatever the diagnosis is. So that is what ADPI means in a nutshell. So the next one we're going to talk about are the documents and charts. So it's very important to understand these documents and they also love to ask about these documents. The first one that I will talk about is a progress note. So these progress notes are the ones that show interventions during a shift, and they also show a patient's progress. How is the patient doing? What happened from seven to three? Or what happened from seven to seven? This is where you chart along the way to show what care you provided and how the patient tolerated it. So that's progress note. The next one is a graphic sheet, and these are typically measurements. So temperature, pulse, blood pressure, respiratory rates, these are usually put on graphic sheets. So know the difference between a graphic sheet and an ADL checklist. So the word checklist is the key thing here in that it's a list where you usually just use ticks to show what you did. So an ADL checklist typically has, for example, uh, oral care, you tick it bathing you take it you know so it just shows you things that you can take right so that's what an adl checklist is and of course adl means activity of daily living so it'll talk about bathing grooming dressing you know hair care and things like that those are all activities of daily living an incident report is what it is where you report an incident so this is an unexpected event. It's something that we were not expecting, but it happened, but it must be documented. For example, a workplace accident. We're not walking around every day at work expecting an accident, guys. But if it happens, we document that in the incident report. And of course, this is the best way to put it. And then the manager can follow up. And a good thing about incident reports is if there are a lot of like, like, qualifiers or you start to see a trend in a specific issue, then it can be addressed. So incident reports are very important, even on a management level, to discover what exactly is going on on a certain unit, for example. So when you are documenting in all of these, you must use the 24-hour clock format. So I will reiterate this and I put this in, I underlined it because I said there is no colon between the hours and the minutes. If they ask you this question, please do not get it wrong. So for example, 1 a.m. is 0100. There is no colon between 01 and 00. It's just 0100, just like that. And 4 p.m. is 1600. If you have any issues with knowing about the 24 hour clock, there are many videos on YouTube to discuss what that means. So I would urge you to take a look at that and get more information about it because it would be very, very hard for you to lose a mark on the 24 hour clock. The next concept that we're going to talk about is Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So this is a very important part of module one as well. So this is where you kind of see a tower. It looks like a pyramid, if you remember it. And the needs are arranged in order of importance. So the lower needs must be met first. And then the needs go from lower and up, up, up. So what happens is the base is very wide. And why it's very wide is they're trying to show that this is a very important need. 
But as you go up in the pyramid, they're saying this is important, but not as important as the one at the bottom. So as per Maslow, you cannot meet the next need until you fully meet the lower one. So the first one or the bottom one with the widest space is physical. So what's physical? Oxygen, water, things like that. And then the next one is safety. Do you have some way to live? But honestly, do you really think you're going to think about where you're living if you do not have oxygen or water? You know, so Maslow's hierarchy of needs is very easy to understand why once you start to look at like, okay, this makes sense. I need this before I get that. And then the next is love and belonging. So for example, if you are not, if you don't have a home or you're not feeling safe, you're not going to be thinking about love, you know? So they're trying to show that first you need this to then think about that. So the next one is self-esteem after love and belonging. And the final one is self-actualization. And not everybody gets to this level. Self-actualization is very tiny, but a lot of people do not get there. This is where you really fully accept yourself and are great, like you have gratitude about everything and you just honestly are in a good place. So unfortunately, not a lot of people get there. So the next thing that we're also going to discuss is the other stages of, I guess, development. This is under growth and development, and this is in chapter 31. So we have someone called Piaget, and every time I think about him, I think about cognition. So he had four stages, and it's important to realize what these four stages are. Like I said, they're in chapter 31, but the main thing is remember that he was talking about cognitive stages, and he talked about the different things that at different ages you should achieve on a cognition level, and it also shows how the brain develops. Then we have Erickson, who's more psychosocial. So psycho means psych, which means the mind, and social means social, which means to do with people. So he has eight stages that span a lifetime from the very beginning to the very end. For example, the first one he starts with is trust and mistrust, where he talks about, you know, a young child should trust their parent. You know, they look for their mom. Like, for example, if they're crying, they're expecting that their mother will breastfeed them. If that doesn't happen over time, they start to mistrust their parent. So Erickson has all these different stages as well. And then at the end, it's integrity versus despair for the very final stage, stage eight. So it's important to know what each of these stages mean to really outline how someone's life is going. So that's the growth and development. The next thing you need to know, and I know module one is very, very long, guys. Bear with me. We're almost there. But the next thing you need to know is about like the changes that happen as one gets older. So unfortunately, like I spoke about earlier, there's so many portrayals in the media about how old people are and how they should act. I think it's starting to change a little bit, though. We're starting to have more positive views. But overall, the images in the media emphasize ageism. Okay, so it's important to reflect on your personal biases and just other people's biases as well, especially when caring for older adults. But there are many things that happen when people age, and we're going to talk about them right now. So the first thing is people go through emotional changes. For example, when they lose their loved ones or they lose their pets or they lose their homes. This is a very emotional, difficult time. Or they go through social changes where they now go into retirement. Now they're on a pension plan. They might give up their house and move into a retirement home. This is also very difficult. So depression may occur, but it's not something that we should say is inevitable. It's not something that we should say, oh, it's normal. It is not normal for depression to occur. It's something that you should report to the nurse in a timely manner so that it can be addressed. And then there are lots of changes that happen. So physical changes, for example, the integumentary system, which of course means the skin. The skin loses its elasticity and fatty tissue layer. Men go through hair loss. Women have hair thinning. You also may have gray hair or white hair, etc. Other physical changes. Musculoskeletal system. The muscles decrease in number. 
they atrophy, which means they start to wear down and to kind of, you know, wear away. Bones become brittle, which opens up a lot of like hip fractures, etc. And mobility decreases. So they used to do a lot more walking, but now it's difficult. Now they might need a walker. Now they might need a wheelchair. Who knows? But that's another change as you get older. The nervous system also changes. Nerve conduction and reflexes become slower. They'll put their hand on a hot stove, but it takes a while for them to sense that. So before you know it, they have a major burn and now they're going to a unit for that to be treated. Taste decreases and sleep patterns start to change. For the circulatory system, the arteries that are supposed to pump blood away from the heart to the rest of the body, they start to narrow and one may need rest because the oxygen is not flowing like it did before. For the respiratory system, which is the lungs, there's now dyspnea, which means difficulty breathing. There's less energy to cough or clear airway secretions, meaning they pull in there and there's a lot of congestion. For the digestive system, which means a system that breaks food down to allow it to go out and to take all the nutrients, there's now difficulty swallowing, which we call dysphagia. The teeth start to get lost. They may need dentures at this point. And peristalsis decreases, meaning that they may be constipated or meaning that the food they eat is not kind of going down in a smooth wave-like form. It's taking a longer time. Other physical changes are like the urinary system. So the bladder size decreases, meaning they need to use the toilet a whole lot more, but maybe they cannot make it on time because the mobility has decreased. So now they have incontinence episodes. And it also means they cannot hold their urine as much as they can like they did before. For men, their prostate size increases, so they'll need prostate checks. Prostate checks usually start around the age of 50, where they really go and they check, they do like a digital rectal exam. And what I mean by that is a physician will put a finger up the anal area to check for the prostate to see if it's big. So that starts to happen. And then every person will start to go through a high risk for a urinary tract infection. And the final physical changes in the reproductive system, orgasms are less forceful, erections are lost quickly, menopause occurs for women so they cannot have children anymore, and last but not least, women can also experience vaginal dryness. So there are way more symptoms, way more components than this guys. I kind of just picked the ones that I felt were very important, but they definitely lots of changes that happen as an adult ages. So yes, guys, so this finalizes module one. I did go through all the chapters that I had listed in the beginning, and I just picked out what I felt is very relevant and summarized it. So I'm hoping that this is going to be good for your study purposes. I will ensure that I do module one all the way to module 12, and I'm hoping that this will be good as a study aid before your exam, or if you're doing the NAC before your NAC, just to have a summary of each module. Let me know what you think, if this is helpful or not, and thank you so much for your time, and see you next time, and please do not forget to like, share, and subscribe. Bye, guys.